Welcome to the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This laboratory, operated by the University of California under a contract from the United States Department of Energy, is engaged in research and development in a variety of energy-related fields, including nuclear explosives, laser fusion, magnetic fusion, and biomedical studies of the impact of energy technology on the environment. For the more than 30 years that the laboratory has been in business, we've relied heavily upon computers to model the physical phenomena that we are studying. These models approximate the continuous nature of the physical world with numerous small zones forming a mesh-like structure. To rely solely on experiment rather than also on these models would be prohibitively expensive and would involve us in numerous environmental and safety problems. As you can perhaps hear from the background noise, we are now located in one of the two major computer centers at the Livermore Laboratory, the Livermore Computer Center. And behind me, in its final stages of installation, is the Cray XMP. This computer, the latest in a long line of computers on which we have done our simulations, represents the state of the art. It has a cycle time of eight nanoseconds, a memory of more than 250 million bits, and consists of two processors that operate simultaneously and in parallel. The vast size and power of a computer such as this is needed in order that our models can have many small zones, can work with high precision arithmetic, can involve a variety of physical phenomena in the same calculation, can use two and three dimensions, and can be rerun several times varying various physical parameters. The history of computing at Livermore is in part the history of the largest and most powerful computers of the day. We have stepped into a computer museum at Livermore in order to review this history. The first generally available commercial computer was the Remington Rand Univac 1, which was delivered to Livermore in April 1953, just seven months after the laboratory was founded by Ernest Lawrence and Edward Teller. The computer delivered to Livermore was the very same one that had appeared on national television the preceding November, correctly predicting the landslide victory of President Eisenhower over Adlai Stevenson. The Univac 1 has a computing power about 140,000th that of the XMP. Its computing elements were 10,000 vacuum tubes, and their memory element was a mercury delay line. This computer was programmed using absolute machine language without even an assembler to help in the programming process and was operated in a hands-on fashion in which the programmer or physicist actually sat at the console of the computer while he ran his problem. The Univac 1 did not meet our computing needs, and so over the next several years, in the mid to late 50s, several computers in the IBM 700 series were acquired. The 701, which used a Williams tube memory, and the 704 and 709, which like subsequent computers, used core memory. These computers were as programmed in assembly language, and beginning with the 709, we began to use batch processing rather than hands-on operation. Also at this time, we became involved in the Fortran project, the first high-level language, and toward the end of the era, began to use Fortran extensively in our work. These three machines were built in part because we directly encouraged their building by IBM. In regard to the next two machines that we will discuss, we did more than encourage. We actually specified the machines and had them built for, especially for our needs. The first of these machines, the LARC, the Livermore Advanced Research Computer, was acquired around 1960. I'd like to especially call your attention to this picture, which shows three of the leaders of the laboratory. Dr. Edward Teller on the right was one of the founders of the laboratory. Dr. Harold Brown in the middle was at that time director of the laboratory and subsequently became Secretary of Defense. And on the left is Dr. Sidney Fernbach, the one person most responsible for the quality of laboratory computing and who headed the computing effort at the laboratory 
for more than 20 years. The Lark and the Stretch, like most subsequent computers, were designed using transistors rather than vacuum tube. And here's an example of the Lark circuitry uh, in the transistorized style. Neither the Lark nor the Stretch was much of a commercial success. However, IBM learned a great deal from their efforts with the Stretch, and that led to commercially successful transistorized computers, the 7090 and 7094, both of which were used at the laboratory. However, they did not meet our needs, as none of the other ones had. So we moved on to a near, new series of computers built by the Control Data Corporation. We first of all acquired a 1604, then a 3600, and then finally a really major computer, the Control Data 6600. During this era, four important things happened in regard to software development at the laboratory. First of all, we developed a compiler that was expressed in its own language. That is, a compiler that could compile itself. The language was LRL-TRAN, a variation of Fortran, which we had developed. Secondly, we used this same language, LRL-TRAN, to write our operating systems. We had been operating, writing our own operating systems ever since the time of the LARC, since commercial operating systems did not meet our needs. But now we had switched from assembly language to Fortran for these systems. Also with the 6600, we introduced time sharing, which replaced the batch mode of operation in which the user sitting at a terminal in his office could directly contact the machine. Finally, at this time, we introduced networking, which allowed us to connect all our computers together in one big interacting web. We called our network Octopus. However, once again, we still didn't have something that fully met our needs, so we began to look to new designs of computers. We investigated a concept called Solomon, which was an idea for parallel processing, and the Solomon idea was partially realized in the ILLIAC-4, which was ultimately installed at the NASA facility at Ames. However, we did not acquire parallel processing until the arrival of the XMP. What we did acquire was the STAR-100 computer from Control Data, which was not a parallel processor, but a vector machine. Had very complicated circuitry, as you can see. With a single instruction on a vector machine, a long sequence of similar operations are carried out much more rapidly than they could be if each separate operation had its own instruction. Programming a vector machine is quite a bit different than programming other machines, and we were a pioneer in the era of vector programming. There are two other machines that were acquired in the 1970s, like the STAR, the Control Data 7600 and the Cray Research Incorporated Cray 1. These machines are in use at the laboratory to today, and we will visit them now. This is one of three 7600s at the Livermore Computer Center. Together with four Cray 1s and the XMP, they make a total of eight major computers in the Octopus Network today. These computers, like their predecessors back to the mid-1960s, are used in a time-sharing mode and are accessible only over the network. The first 7600 was installed about 1970, and the first Cray 1 a decade later. The Cray 1, such as the one over here, is similar in appearance to an XMP, but is about a half generation earlier in computer technology. This brings up to date the history of major computers at Livermore, and many make the mistake of thinking that that is the whole story, but such is not the case, as we shall see next. Large computers require the support of large input, output, and storage devices. We shall discuss storage first. This is our newest storage device, the automated tape library, which has a capacity of two trillion bits. However, today we record that many bits every three to four months. And so we were actively searching the marketplace for an even larger device. This device can load, unload, wind, rewind, read and write magnetic tapes automatically. Its inner workings involve complex sequences of mechanical motions. 
The history of storage at the laboratory begins with magnetic tape. First, this metallic univac tape, then later acetate tape, and finally the modern mylar tape. Beginning with the IBM 700 series and continuing through the Lark, we use drums, and then beginning with the stretch discs. With the introduction of the Octopus Network in the mid-1960s, it was no longer the case that every storage device was associated with a single computer. Instead, the larger devices were shared by all the computers through the network. There was the IBM data cell, and then the IBM photo store, an extremely complex machine with an entire chemical factory built into it for developing its storage medium, which was high-density silver halide film. In the 1970s, we acquired the Control Data 38500, which stored information magnetically in these little cartridges. The most outstanding software innovation during all this time was the introduction in the mid-1960s of a directed graph naming structure or directory system and the introduction of the use of capabilities as a way of proving access rights to files. Now that we have considered computer storage, let us turn to the subject of output and visit our newest output device. This is our newest output device, the fastest printer available today, the IBM 3800. We have two of them, and between them they produce about three million pages per month. In addition, other devices, mostly microfilm recorders, produce 10 more million pages. This device uses a laser to draw images on a drum. Toner then transfers the image from the drum to the paper. The printer is about to start so that you can see the paper move at its 18,000 line per minute rate. The first computer output device at Livermore was the Uniprinter, an electric typewriter attached to the Univac computer and producing this kind of output at a speed of 10 characters per second. Starting with the Remington Rand Univac printer in 1957, all the major output devices at the Livermore Computer Center have been shared among the major computers. Today that sharing is over the Octopus Network, but in earlier days the devices were run offline using tape. Following the Remington RAN were printers produced by Stromberg, Carlson, and Xerox. The increasing speed of these printers led to an increasing volume of output, as shown by the red line on this graph. In the mid-1960s, a milestone occurred with the arrival of the Radiation Incorporated printer. This one-of-a-kind printer was manufactured especially for the laboratory. It ran at 30,000 lines a minute producing a black on gray format using special electrosensitive paper. This printer was in use for about 10 years when it was superseded by printers producing a more pleasing black on white format. These printers were the Honeywell NIPS, or non-impact printers. However, in one way, the NIPS represented a step backwards in that they ran at only 18,000 lines per minute, and therefore two of them were required. During the late 1960s and early 70s, two other systems were acquired which are still in use at the laboratory today. One of these is TMDS, Television Monitor Display System, which consists of television monitors located in the user's offices and used by them as an adjunct to their teletypewriters. Like most modern output devices, these show not only printed text, but graphs and pictures. Another system in use today consists of about 40 stations scattered around the laboratory. Each station typically consists of a card reader and a line printer. The relatively slower speed of this line printer is compensated for by its nearness to the user. Here are two of the five FR80 microfilm recorders in use at the laboratory today. These devices, like all the large storage and output devices of the Octopus Network, are controlled by many computers. And just as is true for the larger computers in the network, these many computers run systems designed and programmed by laboratory personnel. These devices record images on microfilm, either film strips or fiches, such as you see here. 
Each fiche contains the equivalent of 252 printed pages, but in a form far less bulky. Now that we have brought up to date the history of output at the laboratory, we turn to the subject of input. The input medium for some of the smaller computers of the 1950s was the plug board. Here the programmer plugged his program directly into the side of the computer. However, for the larger computers of that era, the input medium was punched cards. Here the programmer would punch his program either using a hand punch or later using a key punch. The punch cards were then read into the computer through a card reader. With the introduction of the Octopus Network in the mid-1960s, the most common input medium became the interactive keyboard terminal, such as this Model 33 Teletype, a so-called hard copy terminal in that the printed material appeared on a sheet of paper. The interactive keyboard terminals are wired not directly to the large computers, but to smaller computers called concentrators, such as this PDP-8. The concentrators then contact the larger computers over the Octopus network. A more modern kind of keyboard terminal is this soft copy terminal, in which the printed material appears on a TV screen, though this particular terminal is also supported by a hard copy alternative. Now let's see the most modern kind of input medium. This is an office computer or workstation. This differs from the soft copy terminal in that it really is a computer on which the user can do much of his computation. This computer then can contact the other facilities available over the network, such as the large computers, the large storage devices, and the large printers and microfilm recorders. The net result of all this is what we call a network or distributed operating system such that the user can, any time he wants, from his office, contact any network facilities and share them with other users in any pattern he desires. The design and implementation of the software for this network operating system is one of our major projects at the present time. So we end where we began, back at the Cray XMP, which has now been brought online. The internal parallelism in this computer reflects the inherent parallelism in a distributed network such as Octopus and is expected to characterize the newer and more powerful computers that we will be acquiring over the next several years. However, looking even further into the future, say 30 years, it is difficult for us or for anyone else to foresee what that world will be like, just as it would have been difficult for those people 30 years ago working on the UNIVAC-1 to foresee what our world is like here today.